Hey everyone, in this video we're going to be going through the incompressible potential flow equation. By adding solutions of this flow equation together, we can solve for the flow around an airfoil, for example, like I'll be going through in my panel methods videos. We're going to start with the general Navier-Stokes equations, which already themselves have a couple of assumptions inherent in them. These are complicated to solve and they require numerical solutions. So what we're going to do is we're going to use two assumptions to kind of boil this down into a uh, more easily solvable form. So the first assumption that we're going to use is irrotation flow, which is saying that the angular velocity or vorticity is zero, and the second assumption is incompressible flow where the density is constant. To get what is called the potential flow equation, all you need is actually the first assumption, the irrotational flow assumption. This will give the full potential equation. Uh, this is good for both compressible and incompressible flows. So in a future video that I'll make, the compressible potential flow equation is used for uh, doing the method of characteristics that will give you a nozzle or a rocket nozzle design for example. When we then add in the second assumption, the incompressible flow assumption, this is what gives us the incompressible potential flow equation, which gives us a simpler form that we can use to solve for the flow around an airfoil. Let's start with the first assumption, the irrotational flow assumption. We're going to be using the equation for vorticity here, which is just twice the angular velocity, and I'll derive this equation in a future video. The vorticity is equal to the curl of the velocity, so vorticity is equal to the del operator crossed with the velocity vector. For irrotational flow, flow, the vorticity is zero everywhere in the flow, so we could say that the curl of the velocity is equal to zero everywhere in the flow. So the question here is what values of the velocity always satisfy this equation? And we'll ignore the trivial solution of the velocity equaling zero, because that's always going to be the case and it doesn't give us anything interesting. Physically, in an irrotational flow, the fluid element can only translate in space. And note that uh, you can also actually have angular velocities of the sides of the fluid element, but they have to be equal and opposite. So now we're going to recall the vector identity that the curl of a gradient of a scalar field is equal to zero. So curl is del cross something. That something is the gradient of the scalar field, which we're going to call phi in this case. And the gradient of a scalar is del phi. And so we have del cross del phi is equal to zero. So I do have another video on this topic, this vector identity, so I'm not going to go through this, but essentially I'm just proving here that this del cross del phi equals zero is in fact true, as long as you assume the symmetry of second derivatives, which in most cases that you'll ever encounter is true. So now let's compare the irrotational condition to the vector identity from the previous whiteboards. The irrotational condition was this del cross v is equal to zero. The vector identity was del cross del phi is equal to zero. And from these two equations, we can see that the velocity can be written as velocity is equal to del phi, or the gradient of phi, some scalar field. And so what we do is we call phi the velocity potential. So what's so cool about this equation here? Why do we care? Well, instead of solving three equations for the three unknown components of the velocity, i hat, j hat, k hat, or x, y, z in Cartesian coordinates, we can now just solve one equation to find phi, the velocity potential, and then we can use this uh, by taking the gradient of phi to get the three velocity components. So down here you can see the uh, i hat component or x component in this case is d phi dx, the y component is d phi dy, and the z component is d phi dz. So we just found that we can get the velocity vector v as a function of only a scalar field phi using this equation here, which is great if we know phi, but we don't yet. So to get the compressible potential equation, we would use both mass and momentum conservation equations, and we would get an expression that we can solve for phi. We don't want to go there just yet. That's for another video. So for the incompressible potential equation, what we want to do is assume that the density is constant. That's the incompressible assumption that we talked about earlier. And we're only going to need to use the mass conservation equation. So we're going to use the mass conservation equation shown here, d rho dt plus del dot rho v is equal to zero. And we're going to assume that the density is constant. That's our incompressible flow assumption. So rho is equal to a constant. And you can see over here that the derivative of a constant is equal to zero. So this will cancel out. And you can also say that because density is constant, you can pull it out of this dot product, divide it through, and get our final equation. But let's just look at the second term right here a little bit more closely. So what I'm doing here is I'm just showing those steps that I just talked about a little bit more closely. So we're going to take the del operator, that's ddx i hat plus ddy j hat, dot it with rho v, which is rho u i hat plus rho v j hat. And we're going to take the dot product, so we're going to multiply the i hat components, add them to the j hat components. So d rho u dx plus d rho v dy. Now we're going to use the chain rule for each of these terms. So we have rho du dx plus u d rho dy. That's the first term. Similarly, 
rho dv dy plus v d rho dy. That's the second term. And now we're going to uh, use the incompressible assumption here that density is constant. So this derivative and this derivative here are going to be equal to 0. So we'll go like that. And we're left with rho du dx plus rho dv dy here. And we can factor out the density rho du dx plus dv dy. So from the equation up here again, we have that the time derivative cancels out, and then this you can actually write as this. So we have rho du dx plus dv dy is equal to zero. And if we divide both sides by rho, we end up getting du dx plus dv dy is equal to zero, which you can just write as del dot v is equal to zero. So this equation that we just solved for is the incompressible mass conservation equation. And we're not actually done yet because you can see that this equation is solving for velocities. And we said that we wanted to solve for the scalar uh, velocity potential phi. So what do we need to do? So let's look at those two dashed box equations that we had from previously in the video. We have that we can say that the velocity is equal to the gradient of the scalar field, phi, or the velocity potential. And we also have the incompressible mass conservation equation, del dot v is equal to zero. We can plug in v here, and we get del dot del phi is equal to zero, which results in the famous Laplace's equation, del squared phi is equal to zero. Just in a little bit more detail, if we take this equation down here, we have del operator here, dotted with the gradient of phi, which is here, and we take the i hat components, multiply them together, plus the j hat components, multiply it together, so we get d squared phi dx squared plus d squared phi dy squared, and that's equal to del squared phi. So now we have an equation that we can solve for phi. That's what we didn't have before. We never had an equation to solve for phi. But what we have now in Laplace's equation is an equation to solve for the velocity potential phi. And once we solve for phi, then we can solve for v using this equation here, written down here. So v is equal to d phi dx in the i hat direction, plus d phi dy in the j hat direction, plus d phi dz in the k hat direction. So that's the u, v, and w. Note, sometimes I used just the 2d, but you can do the velocity potential for three dimensions. So Laplace's equation is linear and it's second order, but the second order doesn't matter as much. The linear is what makes it so powerful. And so we're, we are able to use the principle of superposition because it is linear. And this just says that uh, the sum of individual solutions to Laplace's equation is also a solution. So phi can be a combination of one solution plus another solution plus any number of solutions, and it'll still be a solution of this equation up here. Looking ahead to my next videos, there are these things called elementary flows, which are very simplified flows that are solutions to Laplace's equation. So these are all solutions to Laplace's equation. And if you add these together in a certain way, you can get more complicated flows, such as the flow around an airfoil. And you can actually even predict the lift around an airfoil. So that was the incompressible potential flow overview. In the next videos, I'll be going through uniform flow, source flow, vortex flow, and combinations of these flows with some code in MATLAB and Python. Because to do the panel methods, we're going to need to build up from these simplified solutions. And you need to see how you can do them or code them in a simple program before we can start building more complicated flow types. Thanks for watching.